Greetings, fellow explorers, and welcome to the second episode of Geekoscopy 101. It's the podcast show that explores the nexus between science, story, wonder, and philosophy with me, your host, Yanis, a.k.a. Dr. Kisten, a.k.a. the artist formerly known as The Tunes, before my rebrand to Geekoscopy. And today, we're discovering the wonders of archaeology with Dr. Tammy Hotchkiss Reynard at the Witz Origin Center Museum. How are you doing, Tammy? Oh, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's really good to have you. I met you last year at Comic Con, uh, the Kids yeah. Con part. Yeah, and I was really impressed by Vitz's showing. Pretty much the only university there, right? I don't remember seeing anybody else. Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys are closer than other universities, I I suspect. <laughs> but <laughs> in that vein, tell us a bit about who you are and what you do. Cool. So, yeah, my name, um, people always get confused by my name. I am Tammy Hodgkiss. And that's what I, the name I use academically, but my married surname is Reynard. So I'm a bit of both um, yeah. and or either. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm a curator at the Origin Center Museum at Wits University. And I'm an archaeologist. So I went went through Wits, have stayed at Wits, and I, I focus on Middle Stone Age archaeology. So that's the period between 30,000 and 300,000 years ago. Um, and it's an, it's an important time for when humans actually became human. Um, and I love what I do. I've, I love being a curator and being an archaeologist. It's a really nice mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Actually, I thought of an interesting question now that you said mid-Stone Age, and we'll get to that a bit later. But first, I want to go back to, to the beginning of little Tammy Hodgkiss mm-hmm. and how mm-hmm. she decided to actually get into the study of archaeology. It was a little bit by chance. I remember coming to Wits on open day when I was in matric, and um, there was a, one of the archaeologists was Tom Huffman, who's a, a well-known archaeologist at Wits, and he was um, he had a he was using a furnace and a big um, I, don't know, I can't even remember what it's called, but he was doing a furnace and showing how iron is smelted, and and I just thought, oh, I like archaeology, so I did it as one of my subjects in first year, not knowing what I wanted to do, did a general BA. Um, and, and then after first year, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I really loved it and didn't really want to do anything else. And then I wanted to change my subject. So they aligned more with archeology. span Um, but, um, yeah, I did a whole mix of things in English and linguistics and history of music and a, a mix of things that I think mm. helped me, you know, become what I am today, but archeology span was definitely my thing. And that's why I carried on studying. I was never academic. I didn't do particularly well at school. I didn't do science at school. And then it was really strange to find myself doing a master of science and then suddenly having to do all these different chemical tests and throwing myself in the deep end of that. Hmm. Um, It was was very strange, but I just loved what I do and that it did. And that's what I carried on on to PhD. Hmm. Okay, so for those who are uninitiated and don't understand exactly what an archaeologist does, can you give us a bit of an explanation as to what people like you do on a day-to-day basis? Sure, so so archaeology is the study of of humans in the past that lived in the past. So it's not dinosaurs. People often confuse dinosaurs, which is paleontologists or paleontology and archaeology. And so Archaeologists will look at how how humans or early hu- humans and hominins lived in the past, uh, what kind of things they ate, what their environment was like, and but basically we try work out how how things worked in the past and how humans did what they did and how humans also came to be human like we are, well, like we are today. So you'll get all different archaeolo- types of archaeologists that specialize in different things from stone tools to pottery to uh, animal remains, and then also archaeologists that look at human remains as well. But um, that's a, an, there's very few archaeologists that look at human remains, even though there's a lot of people that get into archaeology because they're interested in it. Really interesting. I would like to see the psychological profile of those people. Just yeah. human remains. <laughs> <laughs> but I you mean, mentioned... Uh, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned earlier that you're into mid Stone Age, um, and I, I remember recently hearing somewhere that there are certain chimpanzee populations or, or, or species that are entering the Stone Age. And have you, have you heard anything about that? Um, does it come so, across your table? Mm, 
So, so middle stone age, you're dealing with modern humans. So anatomically, mm. our skeletons mm. are the same. We're exactly the same. Then mm. at, at about 300,000 years ago, they look the same as we do now. Mm. Um, and the debates in the middle stone age as to whether uh, the humans living then had the same cognitive abilities as us. Did they have speech? Mm. Did they have religion? You know, what kind mm. of, how complex mm. were their, their thought processes? Uh, but then going back to to looking at, at chimps and, and things like that, it's that's very basic stone tool or s- very basic tool tool technology. So not only stone, they you know little things like uh, using sticks and and compound sticks. So actually putting sticks together or making something quite complex, but that's seemingly complex, but um, it's it's very different to how yeah. how modern yeah. brains are able to do things at the same time or multitask and things like that. So it's quite different. But then Lee Berger's stuff in the cradle with Home and the Lady, um, that the dates that have come out, or, although they are a little bit contentious, are at about 300,000 years ago as well. So it's quite interesting to think if such a small-brained hominin like Home and the Lady was able to to do th- – it's, it's interesting to think about what they were able to do compared to early humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I, I suppose it's a it's a gradual increase that happens over thousands of years, you know, to go from that yeah. one stick to then two sticks and then three sticks. And then it probably first has to go from, you know, one chimp or one early human and then to the whole group and then across, you know, multiple tribes and stuff. So I... I don't think it's it's uh, we should be worried about a chump ari- uprising anytime soon. It's probably not going to be Planet of the Apes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, uh, <laughs> but it would be interesting, like if we are still around, like a hundred thousand years, like if there's another species that starts coming up and developing a culture and stuff like that, yeah. or more modern. But I, I think, yeah, it's it's something that. I think people often struggle with, especially with evolution and the, the term that evolution and everything that comes with it, um, and and that a lot of people oppose it to religion, but everything just naturally changes. And it happens over such a sh- slow period of time that it, it's hard to see. You might see it in some plant species in our, our, our lifetimes that you do see things change quicker. But yeah, it's hundreds of or thousands of years and, and humans might be very different in another hundred thousand years. It's, yeah. it's quite cool to think about. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be interesting to see what like evolutionary pressures we're under now. It's probably difficult because we, yeah. it's easy to, like you have to be really, really very, very genetically not very gifted or like got the short end of the stick <laughs> not, to, not to be able to reproduce, you know, like, so it, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I think like one of the things that might actually happen is that if we do send a colony to Mars and then there's a substantial different population that's breeding, I think that's more of a thing. But like the world is becoming more globalized now. I think we'll actually start like melding into one at some point. I uh, agree. I uh, agree. <laughs> uh, then actually differentiating in any way, I think it might be the opposite. Um, yeah. Okay, so that was a tangent, but it was pretty fun. Uh, <laughs> but coming back to, to recent times, I'm sure the, the recent going on hasn't been easy for anybody. But how do you think it, it affects your field of work specifically, you know, going out there and trying to find information about old cultures and dusty things? Yeah. Well, I think in a lot of projects have been put on hold uh, with archaeologists and and in, in within the museum with exhibits that we've had or anything that's going on, we've had to. They've just been put on hold and hopefully mostly paused and just just delayed and put on a you know some things. They can still happen at another point. Um, but I think also what's something that's really important with museums is is to realize the narratives that we are portraying. Um, there's so many um, mm-hmm. social issues as well at the moment, you know, about um, firstly staying at home, but also different different groups of people. And in a museum, we have to be really careful that how we represent information is accurate and, and that the past is made up of so many stories. And often historically, the stories that are represented are not, necessarily although the one of the people in power um yeah. and and it's and it's difficult to that we kind of need to 
need to represent that and need, need to make sure that that information is accessible and that information in museums and information that that archaeologists are exploring as well is something that's that's relevant and is is something that um, is is kind of multidiscipline that people are realizing the communities that they're working in or realizing the past of the the social past of places as well it's not just about the objects that the, that you find or you know there's so much more to just excavating a site or just making a simple museum exhibit you know it's um, it's kind of a, it's quite tricky yeah i can imagine hopefully not too much is cancelled and it is just a pause. Mm -hmm. um, but speaking yeah. about that, I've I've started to, to well, what's going on now in the in the geek culture community with conventions is that it's all starting to go online. So people are beginning yeah. to host panels and discussions and celebrity opportunities and stuff online. So do you think there's any you know, way that, the, especially the museum, I, I don't think the research really <laughs> will help yeah. uh, going online because that has to be physical in some. Uh, but how do you think your outreach and public engagement and showcasing, well, not necessarily showcasing, but trying to teach the public uh, about archaeology and then the principles you can learn from that go digital or online. Yeah, it's it's definitely something that, that all museums are now exploring. And you have some of the big museums like the Smithsonian or whatever that already have a huge online platform. And they have amazing videos and things in 3D and virtual tours and things. But most, most places in, in South Africa and in Africa don't. And most mm. museums around the world don't have that. And so it's been about exploring different ways that we can bring information to people online and digitally, but, but you're only reaching a small portion. And um, mm. it's something that, that I feel is, is really important. And that's why I, I love what I do because I love the hands-on element and I love meeting people and working with people and mm. So um, that I, I, I do miss and I do, I mean, it, it has to, I can't say I hope it comes back. It has to come back. You know, it has to, we have to be able to, to connect with, with people again and be able to have people come into our space. Uh, but it's been very interesting to, to have to explore this, this other world on our computers and in our phones that, to see mm -hmm. what we can do and see how we, we can connect with people and information in other ways. Hmm. Yeah, I, th I think, um, well, I've always been an advocate for like online, well, not, yeah, online learning, I suppose, because I do it like by myself. If I want to learn how to do something that's not necessarily related to my work as a scientist, like I usually Google it and, and yeah. read up and, and watch a video. Um, but I think it's now more important than ever to have, um, Things that you can only learn in university is also online. And I think I think in the future, like, uh, this is probably like speculation, but I think like in the future, the university role will be more like practical hands-on and like most people will be um, learning online. And those just students who want to come in person and ask a question um, will will be the ones that, that come through to university because... For one, it's like really expensive to run a university and it's also mm. starting to get expensive to pay for university and also doesn't give, um, because of that, there's a disjunct between availability and, and access to, uh, to opportunity really with the universities. Um, so I don't know, I feel like I have an inkling that universities are going to get disrupted um, in this way as thing, people go more online. But it doesn't, I don't necessarily think universities will go away. I doubt, I doubt yeah. they'll just be like death to universities all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. No, I think there's, there's definitely an awareness of how much information is online and mm. information that's free online and, mm. you know, things like that. And, and that you can do so much learning online, um, even if it's, it's paid for learning. And um, I think, yeah, it, it's, it's a very, I think archaeology is a very hands-on study, you know. And so, but I mean, UNISA has an amazing archaeology, archaeology department. And um, then they, they have field trips and you have, you still have that hands-on element as well. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I love universities because they're these amazing 
melting pots of of people mm. from all over the world, and everyone mm. is is different, and it's and it's an it's an amazing space to learn about what you're studying, but also to learn about people, um, and that social aspect for me is is very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of I think a lot of just like young human beings also want that um, the experience of going to university and you know doing mm. the social things. Um, so yeah. yeah, there's definitely also more than just the learning aspect. There's also the okay, you can meet your best friend or your future partner there at a university, mm. you know, and and that's kind of important um, yeah. for life. So going back into the the hands on in person stuff, you guys were at um, the that at Boots at Comic Con and I think Rage last year. I don't, I don't think you were at Rage, but you were at Comic Con. Yeah, I wasn't, but but the, um, but the I would, I display was. Yeah, so how what was your experience uh, coming through to a geek culture convention oh. as a as a university? Uh, <laughs> uh, how, yeah, how was it for you? It was, yeah. it was really cool. And, and it was I was really excited to be going to Comic Con because I'd never mm. been to a Comic Con before and mm. that was really cool. Um and and it was also we have to think about what yeah, the the audience and going, okay, well, would this mean anything to most of the people there? Are they gonna be interested in this at all? Um, especially because it, it does seem a little bit archaic because, I mean, you can bring in, we had our little VR goggles and things, but yeah. compared to all this amazing technology you're seeing around, it just seems so like, okay, we've got a stone tool, you know, and it didn't, it didn't <laughs> yeah. I was worried that it wouldn't be well received, but yeah. we had so yeah. many really nice conversations with people and quite a lot of the people that were there knew about some of the new finds or they knew about dinosaurs. So we had a mixture of the paleontology and archaeology at our stand. And it was really nice. It, we had some really good conversations. So we've had other festivals where you have a lot of more confrontations with people over religion and evolution. And so mm. it was it was quite interesting at, at Comic-Con that I, I didn't have any of those conversations about that. Mm. It was about mm. uh, specific aspects of, of things. So I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. Did you get any kids that now had uh, decided that they were to grow up to be an archaeologist or paleontologist <laughs> yeah, after visiting the boot? It, yeah, <laughs> it's it's really cool to see that kids mm -hmm. just there's something about being an archaeologist and a paleontologist that really appeals to kids, and hopefully some of some of them yeah. will carry on. Yeah, yeah. Fun fact about me: um, I'm sure I've said this before on on well, not on this show since it's episode number two, but <laughs> throughout the show. Yeah. Before I wanted to be a marine biologist, I wanted to be an, an a paleontologist. So that was ah, between cool. between the years of four and eight, <laughs> because I wanted to be a marine biologist. <laughs> yeah, so I was eight. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, yeah, I, I just when I was really like young, like one of the most the most fun things I that was in my life was watching National Geographic on su Sunday afternoon, sun yeah, like Sunday evenings at six. That was like my jam for between four, the ages of four and probably like 10. And a lot of that was like walking with dinosaurs and like David Attenborough and stuff like that. And I was really enamored with dinosaurs early on. But when we did go to the Natural History Museum, um, and we went up to that that T Rex that they have there. I got scared out of <laughs> out of because I was like I think I was like six, um, and yeah, because like it it looks so lifelike at the time when you're a kid. Um, I don't know whether that specifically changed my mind. I think it was more like it was more like okay, dinosaurs don't exist anymore. Like they were around a long time ago. They're not really around anymore. Kind of okay. We do have descendants. Um, of dinosaurs yeah. and there's arguments to be made you know for crocodiles and even chickens um, that seem to be you know didn't change that much uh, over millions of years P like people in my circles either wanted to be obviously because I'm marine biologist I have marine biologist friends um, but they also either want to like study dinosaurs or we were really interested in Egyptology because Egyptology is fascinating yeah. Um, so I was wondering, like, if you had any interest in that uh, being in your line of work, uh, have you done anything in that mm -hmm. space? Yeah, no, I haven't. And I mean, it, it, it is, I think it is something that has de had definitely sparked my interest because it is this, wow, look at this amazing stuff that you can find 
Um, and it was, it was kind of a, a different world, you know, it, it wasn't, but it was. And um, no, it is fascinating. I've never seen the pyramids and I, you know, I've seen some Egyptology and mm. some awesome mummy displays in, in other countries, but I've never actually been to Egypt and I would, I would love to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it seems a pretty cool space. Um, especially yeah. cause it was so long ago and they did these amazing feats, you know, the perm, like we still confused about how these monolithic structures could have been built, you know, um, yeah. in those no, times. Of <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like how, like how many people did you have to enslave potentially, or did you just have a bunch of actual working people whose job all day was to push a rock, you know, from one yeah. space to another, yeah. you know, so it's it's really interesting. Um, yeah. And yeah, so recently, you know, well, why I wanted to talk to you about it, because um, there's this, this series of games called Assassin's Creed. And um, the games essentially are a retelling of history throughout times. Um so one of the recent ones, uh, the most recent one is ancient Greece, but the one before that is ancient uh, Egypt. But what they started doing in the games now is having an outright historical discovery mode. So you, you don't you don't actually play the game because in the game you're like this fighting warrior type thing. It's like an action game, right? Um, but they have like a separate mode that's just for education now. So you just walk around and it'll tell you, okay, that landmark happened around this time and that person did that type of thing. So what do you think about that kind of way to educate people? Um, I think it's great uh, because and, it's usually it, it's people that not, yeah, wouldn't necessarily want to do archaeology or, or anything like that, but they see, oh, these pyramids are awesome. I'd like to know more. And instead of, Googling it, you actually have it in the game in awesome, you know, in 3D and whatever, you know, and, and have it just as a part of the game that you're playing. And I would, yeah, to me, it, it makes it more meaningful. And it's actually a really nice way to, to reach people and to reach younger people. Because I think, you know, you might have a, you know, the kids who might be interested in archaeology and paleontology, but uh, when, when you start getting into computer games and things like that, um, it would be a great way to kind of maybe get people into archaeology more. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm so not a computer game person, but yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it sounds like a really nice thing to have that aspect to it. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's actually a bit. Um, well, I was, I was a bit sad because I heard like a couple of months ago that they put the discovery modes for free on the Ubisoft okay. store, but it was only for like two weeks. So like when I went to check, uh, yeah. uh, when I went to check, I was like, oh, it would be really cool uh, if we if we had access to it. Because I, th I think it's something that should be for free. Like if you make, like yeah. why pay for the discovery mode? Um, also, it works the other way. Like if you enjoy the discovery mode, maybe you'd want to go and buy the game. It's like marketing in the opposite direction as well. Um, It'll be interesting to see how many people are, like how popular the discovery modes are. Like if people are, willing to yeah. pay for that it would be interesting mm. to know mm. um but i mean there's a huge amount of interest with i mean just bringing bringing the past alive in other ways and i think mm. it's a it's a really nice way of doing it and and a lot of museums and um researchers don't have funding to do that um mm. and so to actually work together with with other um yeah with other teams and people that actually know computers and how to make these games it's, it's a really great idea mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, it also provides jobs for the archaeologists because they get to consult yeah. on the games. <laughs> yes, yeah, somebody, that's, yeah, exactly. That's what we need. <laughs> somebody has to keep the science in check. We can't have these game developers <laughs> just doing whatever they feel like. Um, yeah. I think I think the interesting one for you to look at would be the the Far Cry game because that's kind of like caveman okay. days. Yeah, oh, I forgot uh, what it's called. Yeah. Um. Okay, so over the course of your career, since you decided you want to be an archaeologist, what has surprised you the most, be it a spe specific finding or a specific conversation or something that you achieved? Uh, what did you not expect to do in your life that you ended up doing? Yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, I, I always knew I'd be, I, I like dirt and I like digging in the dirt and I liked exploring mm. things. But I think it was... 
for me it was it was just it's amazing to to sit at these sites and sometimes you you three meters under the surface in a in a in an excavation pit and you have all these layers of sediment next to you and it's amazing to think that 60,000 years or whatever 60,000 years ago somebody was sitting here around a fire you know chatting to a friend mm. making food mm. And it's just this amazing thing to to think of. It's not just things that you that you're digging up and that you're researching. You actually are. Um, it's it's people that made them, or uh, animals that died, or people that died. You know, and it's um, yeah. I, I just think that's really cool. And and there's been so many so many amazing excavations I've been on, and archaeologists I've met, and I, and that's um, yeah. I'm trying to I'm trying to think of this if there's other I mean, there's, there's, there's cool moments. Like I remember when I was in my undergrad and, you know, you always want to find something amazing, you know, and what is, okay, we're going to have to find something really cool and then be famous. And, um, the, I remember finding a little clay figurine. We were at a site, it was about, um, 800 years old. Um, and it was a clay figurine of a sheep, a sheep. And I was so excited. It was really cool because most of what you're finding is is broken pieces of pottery and some mm. beads and some animal bones. And and we found that. And I remember the the archaeologist running the site was just like, oh. <laughs> and he wasn't very excited. And I'm like, but what? And I mean, I've yeah. never known since then what happened with the sheep or whatever. I mean, it's, yeah. it's sitting safely in some collection somewhere. somewhere. Um, yeah. But yeah. But then it's another, all of those things are a piece of a bigger puzzle. So it's not about True. necessarily yeah. making one big find. It's all those teeny pieces and the types of pottery mm. or the, the types of things that you're finding that piece the story together. Mm -hmm. That just remind me of a, of a story I remember watching a video about recently. But um, essentially, like museums in indigenous places asking for their stuff to be sent back from the bigger museums what do you like how, how do you feel about that yeah and um, i think in in the past especially with with, with africa mm. um so so much of the amazing uh past or the ar artifacts from africa is in overseas museums um and I mean, some of the museums, I, I do think it's amazing to get those stories out. Um, as long mm. as they represented, the, the, you know, the, the stories are told right in those museums. Um, but for me, it makes sense for, I, I love the, the thing of having a local museum and having people that feel something with the content to actually be involved with the museum. Um, when, you, when you're going back, a hundred, hundred thousand years. It's, it's, re, it's, it relates to us all. It's not one group, you know. That's where we all came from, Africa, a hundred thousand years ago. You know, yeah, so true, it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So going that far back, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. But I, I don't know. I, I think it, I would like most of the finds from a, a country to stay in that country. Maybe have traveling exhibits and things like that, so that the funding. Uh, th that that can draw tourists and that the money can mm -hmm. come into that country and especially in third world countries that have these amazing histories and amazing cultures and they they kind of ship, ship off to other countries yeah. so yeah, um, yeah I, I think a lot of it's a similar with the study of archaeology you have so many overseas archaeologists coming in um, or well, all around the world that people are, are studying in yeah. different countries and it can add it can be it can be really good and you can get money coming in and you can get all these different skills coming in but you also have skills going back out or yeah, uh, yeah. you know so it kind of works both ways it can be really good you have these yeah. really amazing collaborations but um yeah i mean I, I want the south african material to stay in south africa you know as yeah. much as possible yeah. so it's yeah. south africa to get the credit you know and south africans yeah. to get the Mm -hmm. There's a similar um, arg uh, conversation, I would say, not necessarily mm -hmm. argument. Maybe it is an argument going on in biology right now um, with something called parachuting science. So you have these um, scientists from obviously big universities and um, in first world countries that kind of come through 
and you know investigate things in these smaller countries where the universities where maybe there's not a university or the university you know doesn't have the same amount of funding and they, they just do their research and they take it back home and they publish it there and there's no mention of you know local scientists or local culture or anything there um my, some my friends the argonauts and argonaut science are really passionate about it uh, they they do like citizen science work in the marine biology yeah. space um so they really like actually um, being your science being informed also by local knowledge because there's some things that you actually don't know as somebody who just like pitches up in a forest or something one day you know the local people actually know where to find what and like what to do with them and stuff like that so yeah it's a similar kind of story um, and I kind of agree yeah. with you and them as well yeah, no, no, but I agree. I think it's so important with archaeology, especially because you're dealing with how people lived there in the past. There's so much knowledge in the area that is so important. And to understand that and to understand also archaeological spaces, often they're these beautiful cave sites and shelters and they're used as uh, special religious areas now. And and it's really important for to be very careful about how you just go, oh, well, it's an archaeological find, it's ours, we've got the permit to study it, you're not allowed to be on there because you're going to damage the site. Um, whereas the site may have been used for 100 years as a religious space. You know, so, so it's, it's very important to, to be able to, to work with the communities in the area and kind of realizing how your research can affect people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because you're bringing a different culture to to the area, you know, and I think you need yeah. to be mindful um, yeah. of that. So going back to archaeology, um, what do you think is the most important archaeological find in maybe recent history that no one talks about? Like they found it, it was amazing in archaeology, but no one in like the public space knows about it. Yeah, I think there's lots of things. <laughs> Cause I think a lot of the research, it doesn't, it often doesn't go out, you know, you yeah. kind of have ama an amazing academic publication, but then it doesn't actually go out to the, the broader public necessarily. Mm. So, I mean, mm. there's more, pla there's more platforms now to do that, which is good. Mm. And you can write you know, blogs and blogs and you can do all these things now. <laughs> or or you can, can appear on a podcast like this one. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> um, but I think with me, I mean, my, my thing is, is the middle stone age. And so, um, I think in the Middle Stone Age, a lot of people in South Africa or in the world don't realize how much amazing archaeology there is in South Africa specifically. And a huge amount of our Middle Stone Age understanding of how humans were 100,000 years ago is from South Africa and Southern Africa. And um, there's amazing sites along them, a lot of them along the coast where you have the first evidence of the uh, of cooking starchy products. Uh, you have the first evidence of making paint or pigment compounds and hafting tools, so putting stone tools onto handles. So there's, there's a lot of firsts in South Africa uh, for when humans kind of became human. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily even know about it. You might hear about the amazing things in the cradle, and they, they get a lot of publicity. Um, and, and that's great. That's, it's also just as important. Um, mm. but it's, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, there's, yeah, there's kind of all the way through, there's all these important things. And I think it's, yeah. it's important for archeologists to, to make sure that they do do outreach, to make sure that they try and get their, their information and their research out to a wider audience. It's not just about yeah. your academic world and mm. your site mm. and your research. And yeah. even though that's kind of what you paid to do, um, yeah, the and thing. the other yeah. stuff is yeah. often just takes yeah. so much time and effort, and you don't really see the yeah. fruits in a way. Yeah, I, I have this problem in academia in general. Like it's built around a print media model, and mm. the thing is, print is outdated. <laughs> um, right now, we, yeah. we, I mean, we actually the rest of the world moved on from print to radio then to tv then to you know now the internet whereas academia is kind of stuck in in the written word and there's nothing bad about it you need the written word to con convey you know these concepts in a manner um that you can then repeat it like that's it's built on that way that's not going to change but then i think the extra work needs to be done to then transform that into other media 
because other people are not paying attention to to print media you know they are probably they mm. they used to be watching tv now they're on tiktok and instagram and facebook and that's where they yeah. are um and i think yeah that yeah. that's why the message is getting lost because the attention is not on an academic journal like no matter how hard scientists think it is like for <laughs> one like if you're a random person you probably think that all academic journal like all articles cost $30 in order to get you know <laughs> yeah. um the way they make you the way they make it seem you know um Yeah so I think I think we live in a world where that is actually seems very foreign to uh, the layman on the street you know it's Yeah um, I agree Yeah so I mean the reason one of the reasons why I have this podcast is to try and and get um science out there um in a different manner you know so I'm speaking two kind of languages at the same time you know instead of just yeah. the just the one Um Yeah It's important and I think that's why it's important to get younger people coming into archaeology um mm. and and also and 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 in ac- academia generally um but to also and and finding a way of bringing in bringing in other languages making it more accessible because mm. that's something that's that can you know block out so many people that you have to be english or you have to yeah. publish in this way and using these mm. words and meanwhile they're not accessible to most people or to yeah. many people yeah Yeah, one of my um well the friends I was telling you about earlier the Argonauts one of their friends just started an account called Science in Vanek I think okay. and he cool. I think it's an Instagram and Twitter account and I think he set out on this journey now to try and convey science in in native languages and I, I think it's kind of important it is very yeah. Okay, so back to another deep archaeological question. <laughs> what are you what are you so sure is out there um in an archaeological context that, you know, that you would be the most excited to see when it's finally found? I think exploring the ocean. And there's so much mm. of the ocean we don't know just from a, a biological perspective. Mm. Um and there's probably so much that I mean it would most likely be much more closer to the coastline but there's probably so much that has been covered by water over the years that it would just it's just cool I just like the idea of mm. yeah this 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 other world underwater I mean even in the middle stone age the sites that are now on the coastline that we go oh this would be an amazing place to live, to live you have marine resources and land resources and just everything and the view is beautiful but you know at, at certain stages in history the sea would have been 20 kilometers away so there's so much that has been covered by water some some that we will never find again as it wouldn't have preserved but it's just a lot to that that yeah. could be found yeah. Um, yeah. so it's quite exciting that's but true. then also like exploring other planets that's that's i mean it's it's pretty exciting yeah. to think of yeah what what other life is out there um and and i mean that's going to be something far in the in the future but it's <laughs> it's quite exciting we'll be yeah, dead <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you know of the the transpermia hypotheses uh no Tra- the transpermia hypotheses the essentially states that life on earth could have originated elsewhere and been transported here on a black like, meteor or something uh, um it's 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 within the realm of possibility i don't necessarily think so <laughs> um, yeah. but we'll need significant evidence and the only way we can do that is to build a ship and visit other planets you know so yeah. elon musk is working on that but we'll give him some time um <laughs> yeah so like yeah on the point of of uh, underwater stuff it's like the other problem is that nature reclaims itself and i think maybe that's why a lot of the stuff is unseen um given that it's probably been covered over by a lot of stuff do you think that out there there is uh, an atlantis you know a pre uh, a pre-modern advanced civilization um uh, yes i mean i'd like to think that there is i mean that's mm. just quite awesome to think that there yeah. there was and and i think yeah that that humans i think there's so little evidence that we actually find in the archaeology um of what people were doing there was so much more that was going on that just hasn't preserved 
and that we just don't see. Um, so there, there's a possibility, but it might not be in the way that the storybooks have told, you know, that it's, um, it was, was other things. And so there, there, yeah, there might be these amazing buildings and, and things like that, but it, it might be in a, in a, in a different way. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, if you uh, do, you watch any Joe Rogan, uh, Joe Rogan's no. podcast? No. Uh, but sometimes he has these um, archaeologists and geologists on, and they talk about um, this these areas in the Fertile Crescent that actually have structures that are far older than the pyramids, technically like ten, twelve thousand years, and they, you know, think that they were that that is evidence that they were these advanced civilizations that were actually kind of done away with by us. You know, we like got over them and like we probably took over because there's evidence that these places were like buried over um, with these monolithic structures. Um, there's also evidence, you know, of, of cataclysm. 10, 12,000 years ago that could have wiped them yeah. out if there was an Atlantis. So there's kind of like these side, mm. like, evidence, but not really full-on evidence. And we can't yeah. tell for sure because we don't have, like, you can't prove a negative. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah but, that's, and, and, and there are, there's, there's, it's always going to be this interplay of what preserves, uh, what natural things could have affected it, and what social and, and human things affected how how people changed it's not this this one way that people just advanced more and more and more um things always changes changed and there, there were so many different factors but in yeah. terms of what we see in the end <laughs> yeah i mean like at, at this point like half the world would be like no we're done with this technology and just destroy everything and then start over again yeah. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> exactly yeah um but it's just fun to think about. It's like, what could there mm -hmm. be? Like, could there, could, like, and what if that civilization did not go away? Like, how would we be now? You know, if we, yeah. if we started back then. Um, so Great. let's see, let's go back to the, to the deep stuff. Um, oh yeah, I just, I just, I said, I just had this fun thought um, about, you know, rock art, because you, you told me that's one of your um, specialities. But do you find any, like, draft rock art that's just, like, terrible? <laughs> like, no, not a masterpiece whatsoever has, like, scratches on it. It's like, no, this is obviously, like, version one, not final copy. Yeah. Do you, do you see any of that? Well, yeah, I see what you're saying. No, the, <clears throat> so let me just say my, my specialty isn't actually in, in rock art, but being yeah. at the museum, it's yeah. a big focus and yeah. Yeah. Um, and I love it. It's amazing. And I think yeah. South Africa has yeah. such amazing rock art. Yeah. Um, but no, that's what I find really interesting is that you, 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 fi you see the final piece and a lot, I mean, some of the panels have images on top of, on top of each other, on top of each other, you know, there's so yeah. there's hundreds of images um, and sometimes they're incomplete, um, but they are basically to, to, the, to my knowledge, nearly always final pieces. Always they, final they're pieces. beautiful. Um, yeah. and, um, so it, 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 they could have been kind of practicing maybe on, on things that didn't preserve. Um, but a huge amount of the art has to do with the spirituality behind the art and the, the meaning behind the art. It wasn't mm. that the art was there for, for art's sake and for necessarily only being beautiful. Mm. Um, it was about the, the spirituality. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I find it interesting as well, all over South Africa that you have, you know, that you have some some traditions in, in different areas and at different time periods, but you have such a uniformity in how things are portrayed and how an Ireland, for example, is is shown so similarly across you know across the country. And um, it's it's just interesting that it's it's something to do more with um, something cognitive and a, mm. uh, you know higher powers um, rather than just just the art. Um, but then moving to the engravings, there you find a little bit, I mean, some of them are just beautifully engraved on really hard rock and you, the, the line is perfect. I mm. mean, even for an, an expert, you think, how do you not actually lift up your tool to make a line, to make sure it's the right curve of the animal? Um, and there sometimes you see some scrapes or you'll see some things um, that look like the, it was a mistake. Um, but in the, in the painted art, you, you hardly do. I mean, you, you just see mm. these final beautiful forms. Um, but then again, there's a, a lot of art that might not have preserved, preserved um, yeah. or might've been yeah. washed off the, the surface if it wasn't good enough. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause like, I know, 
um, because I'm in content creation and into anime and stuff. Like I know quite a few like artists, um, whether it's like physical or digital, and like all of them, like their early work looks so much different than what they can do after two, three years of practice and knowledge. It's like it's night and day. Yeah. So I'm, I'm imagining it's probably the same with these rock artists. You know, you don't just wake up one yeah. day and you can do amazing rock art. I'm sure that's not. Yes, yeah. Um, so I was wondering. And, and yeah. I suppose I think yeah. also. I mean, the, the people that would be painting the art were most likely the shamans or the medicine men or the people that had a lot of training in mm. in the belief system and in the um, yeah the spirituality of of the people that were creating it. And so um, yeah, so that there would have been training in that. And so. Um, there's a, yeah, there's a lot that we don't know behind it. Yeah, I was just fascinated. I was wondering, like, where's all this draft art? It's probably like on bark or something, right? Yeah. It's like, or like that's the thing. Yeah. Must be on other forms that that we just yeah. don't see. And this is the, the final masterpiece is is what we mm. see, or the, the the people that were allowed to paint in this amazing space on this amazing surface were the people that were skilled enough mm. in mm. in art and in spirituality. So I think the the final question to ask is how can uh, um, how can people end up in the position like you? What advice do you have for aspiring um, archaeologists? Yeah. Hmm. I think you've got to be open to that. You know, you might want to study human remains, or you might really want to study Egypt or something. But I think you've got to be aware that it's that it's a process, and that there might be other routes that you take along the way, and it's all a part of. Of, of learning and, and you might realize actually wait I, I want to study animal remains that's actually what I really like or, um, and yeah I, I think to to do it at university is 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 really good I mean you have to have a, a degree to practice as an archaeologist uh, but you learn so much along the way and, and go to different sites and you might not travel much in the beginning don't expect to go around the world on all these digs mm. um, but but it's awesome, and you've, you've got to accept that there's there's a, bo- and a boring part of the job, and you might sit in the lab for hours, or you might not find excavating as awesome. But um, yeah. I've loved it. But um, yeah, there's there's a whole different aspects, and you kind of have to choose what you like, but it, know that it might the, the way to get there might be a little mm. curve. Do you know anyone like on the path who just decided to like? quit the academic part and go looking for treasure instead <laughs> like go looking for like uh, gold and stuff <laughs> um, <laughs> no actually i'm trying to think yeah. i mean we get a lot of students that don't carry on they do archaeology because it's interesting but they have no desire to actually become an archaeologist oh, Michael, yeah. or there aren't a lot of jobs available so they they do their honors maybe uh, and then yeah. then have to do something else um and then maybe they'll work for you know, there's some uh, uh p- 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 Companies that employ archaeologists when there's building and they have to do uh, impact assessments and things like that. Mm. Um, and there you get to see a lot of sites and you get you, lots of, you get to travel. Um, but I think once you've gone through the training and you're an archaeologist, the, the thought of just going to discover gold, uh, I, don't, I don't know, maybe some people do fame. And and that's what's going to drive them. But I yeah. think when once you've studied it, you realize that the it's the the story behind it. It's not the the actual object. That's yeah, important. yeah. That that's kind of like the the view of archaeology you get in video games. It's like oh, is this character who's like going out to find you know the most expensive <laughs> rock or whatever, so they can cash Blow it in. Up with dynamite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Get chased by a boulder <laughs> and and stuff like that. But yeah, um, it's it's. It's, yeah, it's. Just, I think it's. It's always like in the media. There's always like this, you know, glorification of certain um, um, jobs or lines of work. And I think with, with archaeologists, it's more like okay, they they jet setting, they're finding all this expensive stuff. Like they're keeping, they have rooms full with just like suits of armor and things like that. And I think it's probably yeah. <laughs> Very different, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you'd like some suits of armor. Like everybody wants a suits of armor yeah. uh, in their room if you have room for it. Uh, but I think your hands-on working on archaeology is different, and and you know it's it's there's variety. Let's say that 
because because human culture is so variable and there's so many different cultures and places and the world's a pretty big place and we are fairly small compared to the rest of the universe um yeah so exactly. yeah so i think and with that i think it's time to pack up camp and head back to our labs and fancy walls or wherever we're going to spend the, our weekend but first tell me why don't you let our fellow explorers know where they can find you and the work of the origin center oh cool so um i'm on on twitter and, and facebook and instagram and things like that uh mostly under uh, tammy hodgie um and then my twitter's tammy rain kiss so a mixture of reynard and hodgkiss mm. but find me tammy hodgkiss reynard um and then origin center we also on on um on instagram and twitter and facebook um and we'd love, love to get in touch with you at, at origin center or at origin center bits and it's um yeah, we. I, I think a lot of people don't know about Origin Center, and we in Vits, So, at, I mean, at the moment we closed, so you can't come now. Uh, but hopefully, in the next few months, we'll be open again. And um, yeah, we museums aren't boring spaces. I think they're awesome spaces to explore, and they tell so many cool stories and stories that are that I hope you know that people can connect with in different ways. And so I hope people come and visit and please they can get hold of me if they have any questions about things or I'd, I love connecting with people and finding out what people think. Yeah, and it's been really fun connecting with you, Tammy. It's been a fun chat. Yeah, I like it. Thank you so much for joining and hopefully um, the listeners had something to learn and thank you to the listeners for sparing your time if you did watch it and hope you had fun learning with us today. Otherwise, stay safe. Keep well, stay tuned, and cheers. Cool, cheers. And cheers.